Hey there ladies and gentlemen of YouTube, before the video starts I want to let you know that if you like it, to leave a like and a comment down below. And while you're at it, subscribe to the channel and click the little bell icon to be up to date with my latest content, as well as joining the notification squad or wolfification squad like this pack legend here. Thanks for your support, and enjoy the video. Starve a curse. Feed the soul. Chapter 9. Reflecting. <laughs> With rolled up sweater sleeves and a war ridden winter cloak swathed over a kitchen stool, Summer added the last cup of peeled potato pieces to the pot. Clearing sandy blonde curls from her view, she took a seat, all the while staring indifferently at four large crocs lightly boiling on the electric stovetop. Since the heavy snowstorm was continuously underway, there was always the chance of a power outage. An undesired frown tugged at the woman's mouth. Having a blackout presently would be the worst possible time. Providentially, Summer may have become very private, but she was still very practical. An outsized generator was on standby behind her home if it ever came to that. However, any awaiting moments for the electricity to return within the residence, holding a volatile, beastly, impatient would be a frozen hourglass to his anxious nurse. Prodding her chin upon the marble edge of the kitchen island, Summer's attention turned towards the dozen of mixed other pots and bowls, ready for the raring, ravenous Windigo. The prepared meals had either lids or were concealed with plastic wrap. She had the sudden notion that maybe if the stew was hotter, Ben would at least try to eat slower. And maybe give him time to realize that he was getting full. <laughs> and maybe it wouldn't. The woman exhaled sharply. Despite the soundproof, insulated cellar and its entrance, the ordering Wendigo's wails remained audible. Faintly, but nonetheless still ongoing. She idly flashed back to the pestering Gardena Girl Scout's favorite fantasy book. And although Summer never read the children's novel through herself, she managed to recall the exciting parts, thanks to Autumn being a little bookworm. A smirk crept onto Summer's soft features as she imagined the chatty scout with a sudden speechless impression from witnessing the dangerous growls and hungry stares of the black-furred beast chained in the basement. Sunny would spook her pants if she thought her book's villain was licking his chops at her. The woman glanced at the microwave's clock, causing her head to swish twice in a half a second, and blink at the teal LED lights. It was past five in the goddamn fucking morning. Oddly enough, she wasn't sleepy at all. Overworked, sure, but she had too much to do to even consider a quick nap which probably would contain more nightmares anyway. Summer silently timed the minutes to estimate how much longer the stew had until it was ready. Fortunately, catering meatless meals had its benefits. It took half the amount of time to cook than recipes with actual beef, and concocting vast portions at once aided with the speedy cooking as well. The windows were sheeted white, but Summer didn't need to squint through the frosty panes, nor hear the weather cast to know this brutal, blasted blizzard was still highly active. The howling gale was almost as loud as the bellowing beast. This caused Summer to ponder if some of the older books were true about Wendigos controlling the weather. Upper Minnesota did have long and harsh wintry months, and the great gaunt beasts were known to prefer hunting in the cold for more vulnerable prey. Conversely, the forecast announced this particular blizzard was taking up most of the state, and Wendigos would most likely conserve their energy for their own greatly guarded territory. Still, the concept of the clever cryptids purposely becoming barricaded in ice as high as themselves didn't sound very conceivable. But then again, an insane woman deliberately locking herself in a woodland surrounded cape house with a gigantic, Former anorexic, antlered werewolf wasn't exactly plausible, either. So at this ungodly point, who the hell knows? As the woman massaged her temple to ward off the impending headache, 
Her full lips shrink into lines from deeming her prior endless research on the curse of the Wendigo. After reading innumerable old books, antique articles, and recent literature and Algonquin websites, Summer had desolately concluded that there was no known remedy. All of her findings pinpointed to the curse only can be lifted when the host died or was killed, forcing the immortal spirit to leave. Some quite dated accounts recommending removing the succumbed heart to free the cursed made Summer grimace. In reality, that just resulted in a gutted, heartless husband. So absolutely not! Time's infinity! Summer had learned that there were ineffective attempts at a cure for centuries. Chanting and ancient medicines did nothing but put the beasts in a catatonic state, which they quickly adapted immunity to, and caused them to become livider and hungrier than before. Then the family sought incarcerating afflicted loved ones to starve them, for they believed the insatiable spirit would voluntarily vacate the body. The spirits did eventually depart, but only after their inviolable host departed from severe malnourishment. On the other hand, the latter method did give Summer the concept of confining Ben, but she was doing the outright opposite, feeding the Wendigo, while hindering the curse and its effects. Her unorthodox strategy was outsmarting the possessing essence. Ben was being endorsed to consume his human feasts, digest the meatless sustenance, so both Wendigo and the spirit could finally be sated, and the desired outcome would be for the appeased entity to leave Ben willingly without her beloved soulmate losing his life. Summer found herself mauling her bottom lip, and brushed a finger to be sure she didn't see a trace of red. For regardless of her boat smoothly sailing along, the looming overcast always opaque the water's reflection. Was all this gorging bad for Ben? It was common knowledge that much depleted animals and people too needed to eat tiny portions slowly to allow the body to readjust taking food back in. But yet, neither case was a cursed cryptid being bent on consumption. But could Ben stuff himself to death? Similar to when she overfed her childhood's prized goldfish? Killed with kindness. Summer shook her head tersely, almost spraining her neck. No. That couldn't, wouldn't happen. But if the spirit never lets Ben's appetite be satisfied, would this be how it is from now on? An unpredictable, monstrous husband, forever imprisoned by his warden wife, ferociously devouring every meal as if it were his last? And how, in God's holy name, would she safely clean up after him? If Ben did go belly up like Goldie... Would the spirit take a hold of her if her sterling silver chain had somehow came off and started the stupid fucking curse all over again, with her being reborn as a rapacious monster? With a protesting scoff, Summer jerked her shoulders. Screw indefinite repercussions. She'd reflect on the positive results and retain her motives as intended. For it was too late to not do anything else differently. Beside his successfully filling stomach... Ben's chest and limbs remained gangly, but he was lastly sustaining nutrition in which his neglected cadaverous body so desperately needed. The woman lifted a heated condescent lid from one of the sitting crocs on the island, left her padded seat, and plucked a small mug from a wall cabinet. Then she returned and scooped a small portion of the stew, puffing away its swirling steam. Summer dared not to eat his food in front of him, or the cold-loving beast would have a mega meltdown. She had ran out of sighton, so the majority of it was substituted with tofu. Summer had to improvise with some exotic herbs that she couldn't pronounce, and fried the soy protein before plucking it into the mixture. The texture was still softer, but she figured Ben would believe the human was just extra young and tender. The woman stared up at the vast ceiling, shaking her head again. Christ, it's fucking early. She just referred people akin to damn veal. All the same, Summer was hungry herself. She'd been running ragged all night, and her shunned stomach was starting to protest. Once the stew was cool to her liking, the woman took a bite. 
She swished the gravy-coated morsels in her mouth several times between chewing, considering the peculiarly sweet piquancy. Hmm, not bad, but my person should be more salty. After a brief sprinkle from the nearby celery salt shaker, she quietly indulged her appetite and listened. The pleading mews from overhead had ceased. The task that Summer's bossy conscience kept nagging her to do was accomplished. Nosy Posy was closed off in the master bedroom, which was her favorite part of the house. The woman made sure both its doors were completely closed, and included Posy's litter pan, food, and water, as she honestly wasn't sure how long this frantic folly was going to last. She just could not risk the tiny speckled offense getting past her defense. Just one slip-up is all it would take. Summer cocked her head to the sound of romping about, triggering a relieved sigh under her breath. Good. She's occupied with Bali. Posy's preferred plaything was a toddler-safe ball that her owner found near a daycare center while doing a chore list when Minnesota's formidable weather was bearable. Of all the expensive, interactive toys, a three-inch plastic pink sphere, worth no more than a quarter, was a big hit for the quirky tortoiseshell. Now that her crazy-ass cat was safely upstairs and preoccupied, Summer had opened the cellar door just a fraction in hopes a stronger scent of the incoming food would remind Ben that his next repast was well on its way. Doing so appeared to finally be appeasing him, for Ben had stopped snarling out the repetitive request. This made the woman's heavy heart feel a bit buoyant. Perhaps he was starting to understand that he didn't require to be a starved crazed maniac, because food was becoming routine. Her nearly decade old overly baked plan was indeed working. Summer peered into her clearing cup and didn't gather how hungry she must have been. She placed it down and put her tablespoon into the bowl for a few more mouthfuls, but paused when she glimpsed the basement door. The woman could have sworn its gap was much narrower, and that's when her ears noticed the absence of the above thumping. Summer's optimistic expectations spiraled out as bees swarmed into her gut, and her queasiness was not from the tofu sight and potato stew. The tall woman's rushing legs had skipped half the stairwell before reaching their top. She stood in the direction of the master bedroom with trembled breathing, unable to blink. Her gawking eyes shot even broader when she practically felt the sudden raging roars underneath her cold feet. Hence, any color that Summer's face had on her fair skin was blanched out from sheer nightmarish apprehension. Fuck. No. Unlike the entrances downstairs, all four doors on the second floor had sturdy, long lever handles. And after almost three and a half years, the determined domestic short hair had made a very inopportune discovery of how the bedroom's latch door opens.